Um, so I want to start off by saying, well, why does it even matter? So we, we all think it matters, but why? If we're going to argue it with someone else, why should we care if the Labour Party leadership's doing what it's doing? Why don't we just leave, set up a new party, get on with developing and campaigning for a genuinely transformative programme that would actually address people's needs and start to create that fairer society where all can thrive? So that programme that we were close to achieving in 2017 and 2019, and much more, I would hope. So presumably that's why we all joined or rejoined and even stayed in the Labour Party. And, but even though I'm not sure how reformable the Labour Party is, given what is happening now is a particularly blatant attempt to revert to the shameful historic role of being the second 11 for the ruling class. But I still believe it does matter, not least because, as others have said, firstly, the Labour Party was built by and from the trade unions to act, have a political vehicle for acting in the interest of the working class. And of course, those needs uh, remain unmet and we're going backwards. Um, and by working class, I'm using a Marxist definition, if you like, we've mentioned this before. Um, the jargon, those who do not own the means of production and control rather than those who do. It means the overwhelming majority of people, 99% perhaps, who don't have full control over their own lives. And of course, it must mean championing the cause of those most disadvantaged by capitalism. So obviously our work is, I don't need to go into great details here, um, highlighting and joining with those affected by the egregious and pernicious injustices faced by the poorest in our society, by disabled people, by black and Asian people in particular. Um, I, I've got some stuff there. I don't need to go into all the problems that we're, but basically I'll sum up for those who are punished, being punished for the crime of being poor. And as Graham said earlier, we'll carry on being punished in the so-called recovery. So secondly, it matters because the apparent acceptance by the Labour leadership that there is no alternative to neoliberalism and kowtowing to the powerful has a profound impact on wider society, the, even the ostensibly non-political members. And thirdly, acceptance of the retreat, which some advocate, reinforces the dissolution and demoralization that so many people feel. It fuels resignation, and this can also push people into the arms of the populist right. Instead, and again, other people have said, so I won't go into details, we, the left, must be mobilizing people to stand up for their own rights. Fourthly, acceptance of the appalling treatment some party members have had from the leadership and the party bureaucracy is being copied in other walks of life. We're supposed to set the bar and it's being copied elsewhere, We've failed dismally. Uh, academia is an obvious example. Local government and health center services are also in the firing line, those working in them. Acceptance of this treatment in the Labour Party gives the green light to those still fighting, uh, the green light against those who are still fighting back in other arenas and indeed in other countries. Um, and fifthly, because we are internationalists, and when Corbyn won the leadership, many across the world were inspired. And we cannot let that flame die down, even while we must acknowledge and support, uh, acknowledge the failure and continue to support the monumental struggles for freedom and justice in many other parts of the world, India, Myanmar, Palestine, Indonesia, many other places that rarely get a look in in our mainstream uh, media. And, uh, and it shows that this nonsensical idea that as uh, Starmer's always talking about Britain being the best place is arrogant imperialist nonsense. The fight is much stronger in many other countries and our job is to uh, resurrect it here and stand in solidarity with them. So later on, there's a section about the witch hunt in the Labour Party. So I'm not gonna go into those uh, details, except to note that while it is being ramped up now, it was started under Corbyn. And so we need to be careful at some idea that there were some halcyon days before Starmer came in. Um, and we are fighting back and there was a small but important victory this week. Uh, and it may be that later on people will go into that. Labour activists for justice uh, working uh, alongside uh, the, uh, the group uh, brought together by Chris Williamson, um, the Labour Party lost and costs were awarded against them. But either way, it's our hard earned money going into supporting uh, those, um, those things. And others have mentioned, so again, I won't go into details, uh, vital areas for justice to be fought for, democracy and free speech, open selections and so on. But I guess the point I really want to emphasize is that this isn't confined to the Labour Party. 
uh, and our fight isn't confined to the Labour Party. And we mustn't get so focused on on the organisational things within the Labour Party that we forget that there are bigger struggles going on and the Labour Party is a crucial but not the only part of it. We have allies outside, we have campaigners outside, people who are working on specific issues, uh, most obviously things like campaign against the arms trade, Palestine solidarity, brick up, keep our NHS public, freedom from torture, migrants organised and then all the local groups which I'll go on to in a minute. So it, it's like, I, I guess the discussion that needs to happen is what does fighting back look like? What is it apart from the sending the motions, trying to get left delegates, trying to get a recall conference? What else is it? It's, a, it, it's basically it's anything and everything that's appropriate for your area, but it has to have meaning for people outside the Labour Party for those local community organisations that are doing their best to make a real difference with, with very little support from the Labour Party. Those mutual aid groups that have sprung up all around the country and all around the world, that get lots of praise and very little uh, real recognition. Um, but all, all of these things, the food banks, the closed banks, all, all of those excellent uh, things, um, but they tend to be very depoliticised and it's partly the nature of charitable work and so on. And I think it is our job and many of us are involved in those things. Many of the activists in those, uh, those endeavors are Labour Party members. But to think about how do we make the link between those, those actions which are motivated by you know, very similar things that we're motivated by. We want the world to be better. We don't want people to be suffering um, because the system isn't working. But to actually make those connections um, and, um, and supporting people to, um, survive and manage is an important part of resistance. So in Palestine, there is this term many of you will be familiar with, Tzumud, and it can be summed up as existence through, sorry, resistance through existence. And, uh, and of course, their existence can mean coming up against the Israeli army. But we have much to learn. Um, so we will not give up on our communities on our young people and actually Labour, even under Corbyn, took a lot of our communities, if you like, the patronisingly labelled Red Wall for granted for many, many years. And we've seen what happened in Scotland and now it's happening in other parts of, of, of the country. But we don't give up. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to skip because I know I've, it's too long. Um, but our resistance must also, uh, we, we must do resistance as well as existence. Um, and we must remember that the left-wing left policies are actually popular. Uh, even if the idea, and someone referred to jargon that we might get into, um, might not be. Um, but the disgust at the Tories' cronyism is widespread. The majority of Tory voters and even members want many public services, the railways, etc., brought back into public uh, ownership. And, um, and only the most rabid think that people in trouble should not be left without food and shelter. And what's stopping us from fighting back more effectively? We have so much against us, a hostile media from The Sun to the BBC to The Guardian to the private eye. Our stories are rarely covered fairly if they're covered at, at all. Our victories may be ignored and the attacks on us highlighted. Uh, and of course, we have a Labour leadership and even some union leaders that at best want us all to keep quiet on the any Labour government is better than any Tory government line. So let's not talk about internal divisions as if that's our fault. Um, and again, I don't need to go into a, um, into a lot of details about the divisions that exist that are real and what we are responding to with Labour Against the Witch Hunt, with this, uh, with LIEN, um, Jewish Voice for Labour and so on. We are re you know, responding to deliberate structured attacks on us and more importantly, on the ideas that brought hope and possibility to millions of people in the UK and throughout the world. In terms of the party, I think Graham said it, even under the control of Tony Blair, when local parties and competitions may well have been ignored, debate was not curtailed. And actually the strategy isn't even working for the right wing. Um, Labour's not going up in the polls, quite the contrary. And I suspect that turnout will be historically low in May and only part of it will be because of Covid, although that will be blamed. And the perennial cry that they're all the same, so what's the point, is getting harder to counter. So the leadership is terrified of ideas and we mustn't be. And we mustn't even be terrified 
of ideas that we don't uh, we don't always agree with. So again, this may be a speech for another day, but the whole issue of, of not platforming people when we agree 80 percent. 70%, 90%, but not 100%. We're not here to become some pure, perfect sect that has no, um, uh, well, will have no impact. We have to work on what, we, what, what unites us. Um, and um, I'm going to stop going into my speech because I'm sure I need to stop very soon. Um, but points that have been made before um, about action. Uh, and uh, you know what, what's action and what's debate, and of course, getting into action is vital. But there has been a serious, serious lack of political education in the Labour Party, and I know that other organisations have done their best, you know, um, to, to 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 fill that gap. But it is a sad, sad lack. And so those divisions that the left suffer for so badly have got exacerbated and highlighted. And we absolutely need to understand, you know, this is very technical jargon stuff. We need to understand the difference between a united front approach and a popular front approach. You can hear from Roger Silverman later. He may or may not go into this. But when I was much younger, and so was he, obviously, um, he was my go to person on understanding uh, what was the, the limitations of popular front, which, you know, can can sink into lowest common denominator. That's not what we're about. We're about uniting, where we're united, working together, and where we're not agreeing to disagree uh, and not writing people off because they don't agree on something that you know I may feel passionate about. We all know what we're talking about. Anti-Semitism, transphobia, write people off. It tends to be, anyway, again, point for another, another, another debate. But um, people's lives literally depend on this. Graham has mentioned COVID, but it's not just COVID. In my, I'm a counsellor until May uh, when I'm standing down. But in one of the wards in my, uh, in my town, in my borough, um, there is a 10 year difference in life expectancy from the top of the road to the bottom of the road, let alone the difference in the quality of those lives. Um, the stress that people are living on, I'm sure that part of the, uh, the, the, the shorter lifespan is because of the increased stress, just trying to claim universal benefit, uh, universal credit, even if it were enough money, the process itself, and so on and so on. Lives depend on us winning this fight and doing and being smart about, about the fight. Um, and um, I'm coming to, to my conclusion, so fighting for okay. justice inside the Labour Party, as I said, must be focused on making sure that tackling the justices, injustices outside the Labour Party are front and centre of our policy making. And fighting to be able to do that is part of the struggle. And we must not ape the tactics of the current leadership. Um, and we must not allow the appalling approach that's been taken to tackling the anti-Semitism crisis become the model for tackling racism and all forms of prejudice and discrimination. And yet I'm very, very seriously worried that this is the model that's going to be used. Understandably, other groups will want the attention given that has been disproportionately given to anti-Semitism. So let us get a definition like the IHRA. However much it leaves some people out in the cold from those groups, let's get a report and then let's get an action plan and then an advisory group agreed by some supposed arbiters from those groups, but who have been, you know, given by who the right to decide on the right sort of whoever's. Again, this is totally understandable, but it is a really worrying trap to go down. And we know that the ruling class is very capable of absorbing and even profiting from progressive changes made from below. How many years did the lesbian, gay, the LGBT community fight uh, for e e equality? And yet we have David Cameron, because he introduced in, I think, I can't remember what year it was, uh, 2011, 12, whatever it was, uh, equal marriage, hooray. But in 2003 was resisting the, um, the, um, the repeal of section 28. Um, well, it's great that people, and people can change, but frankly, by the time he was ready to introduce equal marriage, there was little to lose and a great deal to gain. 
So the ruling class, I make no apologies for using that term in this forum, the ruling class can adapt. That's how they stay in control. We need to be at least as adaptable and, and we come from a set of values and principles. And frankly, we don't have any choice. If we are gonna go down, we have to go down fighting. And that fight, win or lose, hopefully win, has to mean something. And I'll finish on the words of the great and much missed Bob Crow. If you fight, you won't always win, but if you don't fight, you will always lose. Thank you, comrades. Thank you so much, Leah. Loads and loads of people um, saying in the chat, great points, Leah. 